Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is Australia South, new 2025 itinerary and Q&A. And it will be presented by our fabulous NatHab expedition leader, Nikki Centinella. Nikki, thank you so much for being here today. I cannot wait to hear about all the fabulous changes. Let's dive in. Thank you so much, Sunny. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name's Nikki. I am joining you guys today from Venice, as one does when we travel a fair bit. Um, so I did just want to preface this presentation that sometimes my reception will be a little bit in and out, uh, but if you bear with me, we will get through and stay connected. So unfortunately, I'm not going to turn my video on and prioritize these beautiful pictures and the soothing sound of my voice, hopefully. Uh, as we explore some of the Australian itinerary. Uh, I am Australian myself. Um, I am from Sydney. This is me. And I am a conservation biologist when I am not guiding. Uh, but I also run the Australian South itinerary and I've been doing so coming on to my third year now, uh, ever since the program first started. Uh, I also guide up in Canada. I was doing polar bear season for the last two seasons. And so it's been really nice to see a good variety of trips throughout the NatHab itinerary. I wanted to explore some of the changes that we are going to see in the new itinerary in 2025 in the Australian South itinerary. We are always listening to feedback and we are always growing. And so we want to make sure that the trips are always going to be the best that we can present to you. And with that, we've made some tweaks to our current running Australian South itinerary, which is already amazing. And we're just going to make it that little bit extra. So I'm going to talk you through some of the changes, but also just give you a general overview of the whole Australia South itinerary. And we're going to dive in with where we're going to go, what we're going to see. And towards the end as well, I'm going to give you a bit of an update on uh, what the travel will be like, what the weather is, what you can expect when you head over there, as well as the physical requirements of the trip. And I want to open it up to a Q&A. Now, normally on the Daily Dose of Nature, we do a Q&A, uh, but I wanted to really open it up and encourage you guys, if you have any questions at all, to please submit them and ask them, and we'll see how many we can get through it as well. Um, and any that don't get answered as well, I can email at the end of the presentation. So please do not be shy. You can submit your questions all the way through. So if anything pops up, feel free to submit a question. And then at the end, Sunny and I will remind you. But let's dive into the Australian South itinerary. Where are you going to go? This is Australia. You can see some very nice, straight, neat borders for our states and territories. We have eight states and territories in Australia. And we're focusing really on the bottom three on the right. So South Australia, Victoria and Tasmania. Now, this is quite a large area. And uh, to give you a little bit of perspective, this is Australia over the top of the US. Uh, so you can see it is a very big continent and country. And we cover a lot of ground. So we really do this in a way that is the most efficient to see a really huge diversity of landscapes um, and get you there as quick as possible. And I'll talk about that travel, but we really focus on uh, our private charters, which minimize a lot of driving time and getting you to the hotspots where we see the best wildlife and the best views and the best ecosystems. This is another map of Australia and you'll notice it is very diverse. These are the First Nations of Australia. And you can see we don't have any of those straight lines. Those straight lines are more constructed recently. Uh, a lot of natural boundaries are limited by different food availability, different animals, different plants. And so we see that here in the First Nations map of Australia. There's over 250 nations and over 800 dialects of language within our First Nations communities. So hugely diverse and we start to explore some of them as we move through the southern coast and through down to Tasmania or Rufi River. This is where our trip goes. You can see uh, our flights here. 
We start in Adelaide or Tadunya, which is the capital of South Australia. And then we head down to Kangaroo Island. Uh, this is the first of what I like to call three chapters of the Southern Australian tour. So we have our Kangaroo Island visit where we're there for uh, three nights. We explore pretty much the entirety of the island. Uh, in the centre then, we have Warrnambool and the Grampians. And the Grampians is the new section of the Southern Australian itinerary. We always flew into Warrnambool, we explored the Great Ocean Road. And now we're actually heading up into more of the inland area of the Grampian, which is absolutely stunning. I'll show you in a little bit. And then we head down to uh, Tasmania. And in Tasmania for 2025, we are adding an extra day. So in Cradle Mountain, we're adding an extra day to better experience what is one of the nicest, uh, most immersive and wildlife full areas of the itinerary. I'm really excited that we have this opportunity to slow down and experience this uh, amazing ecosystem in a lot more depth. So the trip is going from 12 days in 2024 to now 14 days in 2024. And this really gives us the opportunity to let all of these very different ecosystems sink in. Because once again, we cover a lot of ground. So as I said, starting in Adelaide, Kangaroo Island, Grampians, Tasmania, and then we finish in Hobart, which is the uh, capital of Tasmania. Uh, and it is the major large town there, so it's easy to travel in and out of. So I'm gonna walk through the itinerary in a little bit more detail, and you can get an idea of what we're gonna see across these beautiful landscapes. We start in the city of Adelaide to Dunbar. Uh, it is known as the City of Festivals, the City of Churches. It is uh, a beautiful, quite uh, small city if you look at all of the different capital cities of Australia. Uh, it has that really beautiful country to city feel. Just outside of the city, we have the Adelaide Hills, which is renowned for its wine. And in the centre, uh, in the bottom image here, we have the edge of North Terrace. Just to the right of that image, we go into behind the library, behind the museum and art gallery, which are beautiful and free to enter, is the lovely botanic gardens. And they hold a huge colony of flying foxes. So whenever you arrive in Adelaide, there's plenty to see and plenty to explore, but I would recommend going into the botanic gardens. You'll see some of our beautiful birds. Um, as well as this huge colony of our flying foxes or fruit bats. Uh, this is a lovely little photo of uh, our breakfast in the next morning. We have our welcome dinner here in Olo Tadanya in the Mayfair Hotel. Uh, but what I love about this is uh, the breakfast is sort of uh, buffet style, uh, cafe coffees, uh, and you can sit wherever you want. But this group decided all to sit together. Just after that first welcome dinner, they all chose to sit together for breakfast, which I think just really bodes well for a lot of them we've had travellers. We are really excited to be in each other's company, fellow travellers and fellow nature lovers. Uh, and so once we have our breakfast in uh, Adelaide to Dunya, we head straight down into Kangaroo Island. And this is where we really kick off our first full chapter. This is a little overview of Kangaroo Island. We split this into three days. We do the western side, the centre, and the eastern side, all on different days. Um, and it allows us to really cover a lot of ground and minimise the driving each day. Because we focus on one area each time, we're not going to be driving as much between all of those locations. Order of the days, as listed in the itinerary, does vary based on the availability of our presenters. Uh, but you do see all of the stops here on this map. Uh, we see some beautiful old lighthouses coming from the turn of the 19th century and extending a little bit further back into the 1800s. There's three lighthouses here. Um, and we stay in a beautiful place overlooking Pelican Lagoon, which you can see in the background here. This place is called Wanderer's Rest. It's a beautiful new accommodation. It's owned by a single couple, Dia and Nico. Nico is the chef, Dia is the everything else. 
Uh, they're an amazing couple and it really feels like you're stepping into their home. It's so welcoming. We're up in this beautiful treetop canopy overlooking the Pelican Lagoon and we see a whole host of bird life up in these trees. The sunsets and sunrises are absolutely gorgeous and it's really nice staying put. We're here for three nights uh, and it really allows us to get settled and get our bearings here in Kangaroo Island. The food is absolutely gorgeous and they're opening just a special limited uh, seating dinner restaurant. Uh, but when we stay, it really is just us and we get the place to ourselves as we would stay in the accommodation. You can just see the top of the roof behind uh, John and Geth there. It's also the first place that we see our beautiful kangaroos. These are our kangaroo island kangaroos, which is very circular naming. Uh, and these are a Western grey kangaroo subspecies. So as soon as we arrive, we start to jump into those iconic species of Australia. We see our kangaroos, and you can see here up in the tree, nice up close and personal, our beautiful koalas. And uh, we go for a lovely walk through the Hampton Bay Wildlife Sanctuary. We have a beautiful presentation there, but we also walk through these beautiful eucalypt forests and try and spot our koalas up close and personal. There's opportunities every single day in Kangaroo Island to see koalas. Uh, we know a few places that they like to hang out. There's a lot of koalas here. So really get those iconic species up and running. We have a beautiful variety of uh, picnics, not quite as you would imagine them. You can see Tim here cooking up a storm on the barbecue uh, with beautiful St. George Whiting a single steak in there, uh, vegetarian option, uh, beautiful settings and local wines from the island as well. So the company that we partner with on Kangaroo Island is Exceptional Kangaroo Island and they really are exceptional. They really focus on local produce, local wines, uh, any waste if we don't happen to finish our beautiful lunches, which I will definitely eat all of your leftovers because it's so delicious. They will go to the chickens, and if the chickens aren't full, it'll go to the pigs. Uh, and so absolutely everything is uh, reused. And you can see we use beautiful cloth napkins and tablecloths, um, which we can reuse every single time. So it's a really beautiful setup that we have. And we pick our lunch locations depending on the weather uh, and where we're ending up for each day and what wildlife we see. We have a series of presentations on Kangaroo Island. We have this presentation here at Hampton Bay Wildlife Sanctuary where we see our koalas. We talk about the bushfires that happened here. So here, uh, there were extensive fires in 2019-2020 and it burnt out half of the island. Now we're coming into three, four, five years post-fire, depending on the book, uh, and it really has regenerated beautifully. It's really nice to see a natural fire adapted ecosystem coming back with such uh, absolute energy, really. Uh, the whole area is coming back really well. Um, and so we talk about that. We also get to meet the lovely Peggy, Dr. Peggy Rishmiller. She is the world-class expert on echidnas. If you don't know much about echidnas, you will know more than enough after this presentation. David Attenborough, has spoken to Peggy on several occasions to learn about Echidna himself. And I have had guests that after speaking with Peggy, if we see an Echidna around uh, other travelers, have then helped to explain it, special Echidna traits to them, which I just think is amazing sharing of knowledge as we go through. And this is again, that beautiful book from the Pelican Lagoon. We also speak with the lovely Heidi. This is Heidi here with her dog River. Uh, and River has a little cast on his back legs after uh, running after some kangaroos when he was a puppy. He was only about eight months old when this photo was taken. Uh, but River is a conservation dog. And so he goes and he can smell if uh, cats have been present. Uh, feral cats are a problem on the island and across Australia. And that's a theme that we explore as we move through our itinerary talking about different species and how they have adapted to Australia. Uh, so Heidi works with River to identify where cats 
are and entrap them and move them out of the area to help protect native species. Um, because those feral cats are eating up to 50 individuals every single night. So they really are well adapted in a way that a lot of our species cannot cope with. A lot of our species are adapted to aerial protection. So she goes into her background against this beautiful backdrop um, of the western side of the island. We also see some beautiful geological landscapes. So we see the remarkable rocks here. Uh, and I don't want to spoil too much, but they are quite remarkable. <laughs> Uh, and these are really ancient formations. We're looking at 500 million years old of these granite structures that have been exposed and weathered in so many different ways. It really is quite spectacular. We also get to see some other wildlife. We see our Rosenberg goanna, which like to rest on the road as we come by, especially if it's sunny. And we also see a host of marine animals on the island. So we see our beautiful Australian sea lions all nestled here, enjoying the beachside, and a few more here. We also have the opportunity to see some fur seals and some little most dolphins as well. So a huge host of wildlife in Kangaroo Island and really kicked up this trip through uh, a lot of southern Australia. After exploring Kangaroo Island, we jump on a charter plane, so we ignore the entire airport building uh, and we hop straight on with our tea and coffee and we head across to us and chapter uh, and this is what's new primarily for 2025 this is the grampians gary word national park and it's a beautiful old rock formation it's formed in uh, the shape looking like five boomerangs and these rock formations come out of a very flat arid agricultural area uh, sorry, not arid, uh, grassland agricultural area. Uh, but this has been all protected. It's been a national park since 1984, and it is a really important refuge for a lot of our species. And so we spend another three nights here. If you book in 2024, or if you've looked at the itinerary previously, you would know that we normally uh, were going to the Great Ocean Road, the Great Ocean Road is a beautiful part of the coastal uh, southern coast of Australia. Uh, beautiful beaches and a lot of really nice wildlife. It is a lot of travel um, and we have found that a lot of our guests have expressed they want to spend either more time there or um, being able to stay in one place because we traverse so much area. We decided to come up to the Grampians and spend three full nights in the one accommodation and get to know this landscape a little bit better. But we still fly into Warrnambool, we still see the edge of the Great Ocean Road. And we do that, uh, as you can see here, uh, down to Warrnambool. You don't need to know how to spell that. <laughs> and we go to a place called Tower Hill. Tower Hill is an old dormant volcano. It is 30,000 years old. And you can see this is the edge of the crater that you can see around the front foreground and right in the background. And the center is like a nested noir. So this is a secondary explosion that happened and created these islands in the center. You can see the layers of ash as you descend into this old dormant crater. And it's also our first opportunity to see the emu. The emu is a beautiful flightless bird, uh, cousin to our cassowary up in the north. And this part of the raptite family, they're beautiful. They're a little bit dopey uh, and they're great fun to watch uh, as they roam around. We can see them here at Tower Hill and we can also see them at uh, the Grand National Park as well. So really nice, very impressive and prehistoric looking bird that we can keep in mind. Uh, we also have another opportunity to see some more koalas while we're here on the mainland. And we also get to experience some of the uh, First Nations history as we move into Tower Hill. So we have a talk with a First Nations presenter uh, who is from Warren Gundij, Gundij Maori people. And the Gundij Maori people have an oral history of this dormant volcano erupting 30,000 years ago. The people here have been here over 60,000 years. Uh, and so we're talking 
nearly, what is it, five, ten times as long as pyramids have existed. Uh, it is a really ancient history here, uh, and it's a really amazing privilege that we get to speak to the Warm Footage guides and talk about uh, their history in this area. And we go on a bit of a bush tucker walk as we move through the forest and see what uh, bush tucker we can get from our local vegetation. We can try some of the local vegetation. We then head inland and we head up to the Grampian National Park. We stay on the edge and we stay at Mount Williams Station uh, and Homestead. This is an old uh, sheep grazing property. It is, was established in 1836 and it's a beautiful property. This photo maybe doesn't do it justice. It's okay. <laughs> It's a really lovely old uh, traditional homestead that has been completely remodeled for um, beautiful accommodations uh, in the pool area and in some other rooms. But otherwise, the homestead holds a lot of its original charm. We can see some of the dams nearby on the property that you can walk to that hold a whole host of water birds. And we're here for three nights. We get to unload our bags and get situated and uh, wake up to the sulfur crested cockatoos in the morning and listen into that beautiful bird song at the base of the Grampians Gary Ward Fashion Park. And then each day we go in and we explore. So this is a little bit of an idea of what it would look like uh, back in the early 1900s. Uh, and you can see old traditional roses. Uh, you can track a lot of the movements of settlers throughout Australia through which roses have been planted. And then we go up into the Grampians National Park. Grampians is a beautiful location, this uh, stunning vista of books that are jutting out of this really flat landscape that you can see in the background of this image. And there are a number of extended hikes that we can do through here as well as small trails in and out of uh, the, the elevated high ground, as well as in the gullies. And in the gullies, we see uh, different vegetation. We see a lot of uh, tree ferns, waterfalls, riverways that are passing through this beautiful landscape. And it's also the largest area of uh, Aboriginal First Nations roof paintings. This is just a small photo. There's uh, a lot of sites here and you really have to go and see it and feel it to see what it's like uh, in these beautiful cave structures. Uh, the earliest evidence in the Grampians, we're looking at 22,000 years old, quite, uh, um, quite assuredly. Uh, we have really strong evidence for that, um, but we do know that there have been people who have been in the area for several thousand years before that as well. So we explore this beautiful ancient history, but also how that history is continuing and evolving into a really rich cultural landscape still today. We explore the Aboriginal cultures, the Dreamtime stories, uh, such as like learning the different constellations when we look up the beautiful clear night skies that we often get in this more inland environment. If we move away from the coast, uh, we often see some beautiful star shapes, including the Milky Way and sometimes the Dark King, which is a constellation in the dark space within the Milky Way. These are our beautiful sulfur crested cockatoo. You'll hear these up uh, early in the morning with their characteristic screech. They have this beautiful yellow crest on their head, and you can get flocks of hundreds of these sulfur crested cockatoos here in the Granby and Gary Road region, as well as a host of other birds. We have our emus again, our superb fairy wren, our king parrots, just to name a very few. So it's a really rich haven of animals. We also see our eastern grey kangaroos and our wallabies as well. We have two species of wallaby uh, that we're very likely to see. Our red necked wallaby and our swamp wallabies will be in this area. And there's always the opportunity to see a kidna everywhere we go in Australia. So we keep our eyes peeled for them. We also want to see the lovely gang gang cockatoo. We have a lot of cockatoo species here in Australia. We have the most out of anywhere in the world, and they're all equally beautiful. The gang gang cockatoo is quite an elusive find. 
So I will be very excited to see them. Uh, I did see them a couple of trips ago and they're absolutely gorgeous. This is just one of the panoramas. You can see the town of Halls Gap is on the left down in the valley. Uh, and we just see these amazing views that really this picture does not do it justice. So we spent quite a few days exploring this amazing national park and getting to know the ins and outs of Grampians and Gary which is really excited to explore this further with you. After that, we head down to Tasmania, Luchawuda, and we spend a fair few days here. We spend uh, three nights up at Cradle Mountain, and then two nights down at Truffle Lodge, and we finish in Hobart. Cradle Mountain is a World Heritage Area. It has a lot of the criteria. You only need one of 10 to be a World Heritage Area. This has seven of the 10 criteria. It's a really beautiful and uh, unique landscape that holds a lot of diversity that is only found here in Tasmania. These are the button grass moorlands. There are 273 different species of vascular plant here, and a third of them are only found in this area. So super unique. This is where you could be having breakfast as we overlook uh, cradle mountains in the distance there, overlooking the lovely Bunny Creek. And this is Cradle Mountain on a clear day. It is an alpine region, and so we are completely changing habitat. And this alpine region can sometimes be quite cloudy. So we do uh, like to be able to add an extra day, and that's what we're doing in 2025, is we're adding this extra day in Great Mountain to give us a better opportunity to get a lovely view of we're seeing here. Uh, and there are a number of extended hikes around here as well. And by having that extra day, we have an extra day to explore, to hike and go off on your own and explore this really amazing environment. This is the walk down uh, Lila track, beautiful waterholes. And this is through the ancient uh, North of Vegas or Myrtle Beach forests, as well as our King Billy Pines. The King Billy Pines are nearly 2000 years old as individuals individual trees are being recorded at 1,700 years old and our myrtle beaches are found in the fossil record in Antarctica, part of our Gondwana story. So there's so many walks that we can do here. This is a very quick phone photo I took on my way to breakfast because there was a small paddy melon on the path. We are surrounded by wildlife in the cabins that we stay in and we also get to go on quite a few night walks. Uh, these are two brush tail possums, probably up to no good. They're always a little cheeky uh, and I love them for it. And so we go out and have a look at the possums. We can see our uh, paddy melons, our wombat. It's a really good opportunity to see wombat even just outside your door. You can see how close you can get here. They're very comfortable um, as they're munching down on the grass here. They're like little lawn mowers. And we also get to visit Devils at Cradle. Devils at Cradle is a uh, conservation wildlife um, sanctuary and they are maintaining a stable population of our Tasmanian devils. They also look after our other carnivorous marsupials, which are our pet quolls. There are our spotted tail quolls and our eastern quolls. And so we get to have a private our up close and personal tour. This is the lovely Atlas in the arms of Rory here. Uh, and we get to learn all about our devils and our souls. It's a really amazing experience um, and a really important conversation about conservation of our carnivorous marsupials. This is a lovely devil up in the tree with those characteristic red ears, his beautiful whiskers. And these are our eastern ones. Uh, and so we'll learn all of them here at Devil's Cradle, and we also get to see them again at Bunnerwing. What we're adding in 2025 is another day in Cradle where we get to go not just on night walks around the city, which we've always been doing, but because we have that extra night, we actually go back into the World Heritage Area at night to go spot lighting to try and see these guys in the wild. It is quite hard to see these guys in the wild because they are nocturnal. 
And so by adding this day and being able to go into the park, we get to go spotlighting for these creatures. And it's absolutely so special if you get to see them in the wild. I've been fortunate enough to see one devil in the wild and I go looking in my spare time. Uh, and it was on a nap hunt trip with all of the guests who were there in attendance. We got to watch this devil for uh, a good couple of minutes, which was just absolutely special. Um, Often we just catch a little glimpse of them. So by having a whole day there, I'm so excited to spend this extra time looking for these beautiful critters in the wild. We then head down from Cradle Mountain across the Great Lake region, as you can see extending out here. This lake is literally called Great Lake. Um, and we continue down through this uh, semi-alpine area and we head down towards our next location. On the way to break up the drive, we go to the lovely Maracoupa Caves and they have these beautiful crystal formations and they are also host to glowworms. Uh, so if you didn't see the glistening Milky Way, you'll be able to see the glistening stars of the glowworm in the Maracoupa Caves. We also keep an eye out for our lovely echidna. Now the sikkim has given himself a little scratch and you can see they really furry back on the sikkim cup. The echidnas here in Tasmania, because it's colder, have a lot more fur and they're the densest population of echidna in Australia is here in Tasmania. So we're always looking out for the echidna in Tasmania as well as throughout the trip. And you can see the difference. On the left, we have a kangaroo island echidna and on the right, we have two Tasmanian echidna. You can see those really, really um, prominent spines on our, our warmer climate echidnas, blending in more with those exposed grasses versus our foodie echidna, where it has to be a little bit warmer. And then we end up at Truffle Lodge. Truffle Lodge is a beautiful uh, safari style tent, uh, but it's Nothing uh, drab, I can tell you. It's a beautiful location overlooking the River Derwent. You can see the Derwent just past the railing in this picture. Derwent River is filled with platypus, and this is where we spend a lot of our time trying to see the platypus. We're here for two nights. It's a beautiful location. You can do some walks out just from your, your balcony, and you see this whole grass area in front of you fills up with paddy melon, a little wallaby type creatures. At the, uh, at the start of the evening. We also get to go paddling with platypus. We put in a lot of effort for the platypus. They're probably our most elusive spot of all of our target species. And so we need to put in the time. There's really no trick about it. We are uh, putting a fair few walks along riversides, but also being able to paddle on the river getting up close and on level with the platypus is the best opportunity to be able to see them. Every single paddle I've been on, I have seen them. Sometimes it is a small glimpse, um, but sometimes they are right next to you. So really, we just want to put in that time and spend, spend that time seeing all the platypus in the river. This is a very good photo of a platypus. We then head into Mount Field National Park where we get to meet some beautiful tall giants, our eucalyptus regnants. You can see here, our tallest are over 100 meters tall. They're the tallest flowering plant in the world. And we also see our paddy mill. Here's a nice paddy mill and up close. And we move through this uh, temperate rainforest. And if you saw my presentation last week, you would have heard me talk about the difference between our tropical and our temperate rainforests. So if you want to check that out on uh, YouTube or on Daily Dose, you can see all of our back catalog there. Uh, some beautiful waterfalls as we move through this entirely new ecosystem. This is Russell Falls, it's absolutely stunning, up close and personal. And another little paddy melon through the trees. We then head up to Kunyani. This is the town of Hobart that you can see sprawled out, Nithaluna is sprawling out at the base of the uh, Derwent River. So we follow the Derwent River all the way from the Alpine regions through Truffle Lodge and where we go paddling down to where we finish in Hobart and we go up to Kunrani, Mount Wellington and Overlook and we go for another walk with an Indigenous guide down in the valley here. 
We then finish at Bunnerong. Bunnerong Wildlife Sanctuary is where they rescue hurt and injured wildlife from around the island and they rehabilitate that wildlife. So it's a really great opportunity to get hands, uh, hands on really with a lot of this wildlife and really tie together a lot of the things that we see throughout the trip. This is Greg at the front here uh, giving a presentation. He's the owner of Bunnerong and he comes to speak with us as often as he is able able to share his mission with us for helping wildlife throughout Tasmania and raising awareness for a lot of species that we may not have the lovely dance fair kangaroos up close and personal as well. So that's where we finish up. For the trip as a whole, the physical requirements are uh, generally we say you need to be comfortable to be walking for about two miles. There are some stairs and it is uneven terrain as we move through all the different areas of the tour. The um, areas around Grampians will be dependent on which hikes that you want to do, as well as Tasmania. We do have the versatility with our expedition leaders, as well as our amazing local guides, to choose which walks we want to do. So we have a bit of variety on whether you want to do a longer or a shorter walk, but there will be a bit of uneven terrain and we're in and out of the vehicles often um, so that we can go see our wildlife. Often we see our kidneys on the side of the road, but we always have these options for longer hikes. So if you are more physically um, keen, I would recommend going on a lot of the longer hikes we have a lot of beautiful options and by having that extra day in Cradle Mountain and three days in the Grampians we have those opportunities for those longer hikes. It's a really busy trip we see a lot of different uh, itinerary uh, sorry ecosystems and so it is worth taking time to make sure that they soak in and you really fully immerse yourself in each space and that's why I really love the 2025 itinerary because we can take that time to feel more immersed in each space. Our travel, as I mentioned, uh, we cover a lot of ground, but we do it efficiently. We are often on private charter planes for any of our large flights. And then when we're in vehicles, we are in uh, two like sprinter van type vehicles. Uh, so there's plenty of room for us to leave our bags, to spread out a little bit, have that window seat, move around. And you have the versatility of being in smaller vehicles to be able to stop in those smaller locations and get into those really exclusive places to see wildlife. And so we've really worked hard to minimize the time that we're driving and focus more on the time that we're in those spaces and we're out experiencing wildlife in its natural habitat. The weather can vary from beautiful sunny locations like this and sometimes a little drizzly like this. Uh, so we do vary depending on when you go, but also throughout our general summer season, anywhere between uh, our lows in the evenings can get down, especially up in Greater Mountain, uh, in our alpine regions as low as our 40s, and we can go all the way up to 100 degrees. So there is a lot of versatility in temperature. We always have the options to be flexible, stay with the vehicles in rain or hot weather, um, but I always recommend bringing layers. Layers are going to get you through absolutely everything, having that rain jacket, having that extra jumper, but then being able to come down to a nice loose cotton layer, uh, zipping down to shorts if it is warm. Generally, it's going to be warmer in the uh, middle of summer, which is going to be more our uh, January and February. And then on our shoulder se seasons, extending more into October when we start our season through to April when we finish, uh, that's going to be a little bit cooler. So just depending on which weather you prefer. Uh, we also do have some insects. This is an echidna scratching themselves. And this is a beautiful peacock spider. This peacock spider is about the size of two grains of rice, maybe one grain of rice. So they're very small and very beautiful. Um, I haven't had any issues on any of my itineraries with any snakes or spiders being an issue. 
if they're ever around, you just come get us and we can move them away. But generally, they don't want to have anything to do with it. They would rather move away um, and not be in this place. So we do often get some flies in the summer. Uh, they're more of just a nuisance than anything that we need to be worried about, not carrying any diseases or biting you. Um, they're just a little bit up in your face. So generally, the uh, insect situation is quite good. Um, we can sometimes get some mosquitoes in the evenings, but we often carry insect repair with us as well. So nothing that has been uh, in the way of any enjoyable trip that I've ever had. So I hope that just covers some of the questions that you may have. Uh, and I really hope to see you guys there. But I wanted to open it up and ask if you have any questions, please submit them. And I'm happy to answer as best as I can for any anything that you may be still curious about. Um, have a look on the website for the full itinerary. You can see some of the details there. And you can see some of the dates and the pricing for 2024. 2025 is going to be an amazing year for it. Um, we still have availability for 2024. And I hope to see you there. I'm going to be there back in March um, and throughout the next season at the end of the year as well. Uh, we will be going to the Great Ocean Road and we have some webinars on the itinerary already if you want to have a look at that. Uh, but if you want a little bit more of a relaxed pace and you want to head a little bit further inland to the Grand Lines, then I'd recommend having a look at our 2025 itinerary. So thank you guys and let me know if you have any questions. Nikki, thank you so much. I love the tweaks that were made to the new itinerary. It looks fabulous. <laughs> Before we start the Q&A, I just want to remind everyone that they can submit their questions via the questions field in the control panel. Um, so let's see here. First question, um, can you talk a little bit about being a solar, so, sorry, solo traveler um, on one of these journeys? Anything that you can share with uh, as far as accommodation or, or anything else that you've experienced with solo travelers? Uh, yep, yeah. so with solo travelers, uh, as with a few of our itineraries, there is a solo supplement if you would like to stay in a room by yourself. Those prices are listed on the website and the itinerary. So just because you're just staying in the one room, there is a bit of an additional cost to fill up that room. But you can also talk with your adventure specialist and you can be paired up with another solo traveler which uh, can be a really nice way to go because you can meet someone who's very like-minded in the same situation as you um, and it can be a really good way to make some friends. I've had a lot of solo travelers who have kept in touch with each other after. We try and group trips where um, it's not uh, maybe just one solo traveler and then everyone else is couples. Try and keep it so that there's a few solo travelers together it just means that you can move at your own pace. We have uh, usually at minimum any one time, there's three guides. So there'll be an expedition leader and two local guides. So we have a lot of versatility to be able to uh, make sure that everyone is getting to prioritize what they want to see in a trip uh, and have that flexibility to uh, really get in and get out of the trip as much as you want. So. Um, I travel solo quite a lot myself. I think it's a really nice way to go because you get to prioritize your own pace. Um, and you're in just you're just in a group of really like-minded people in this niche world that is this amazing wildlife travel that we do. Um, and so we're always happy to have you along. Great, thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the food that our guests will encounter? Are fish and chicken part of the um, main staples they'll they'll see, or is it mostly beef and vegetable? Uh, we see everything. Uh, mm -hmm. Australia is known for its food. Uh, Kangaroo Island and Tasmania, both as islands, have really established this almost brand in and of themselves of being these amazing producers of food. And then, obviously, in the Grampians, we're in. A agricultural producing area. So we see a lot of fresh uh, food as we move through these spaces. Um, our seafood is phenomenal and we have a lot of seafood coming straight off directly onto our plates that day even. 
Uh, and then our fresh produce, our fruit and vegetables are um, as fresh as they get. You'll be able to see the orchards as we drive through Tasmania. We're doing mainly summer season uh, itineraries and that's our peak season for all of our beautiful summer fruits like our cherries and strawberries and uh, mangoes and peaches and everything. Um, so we have uh, a really good variety that we're able to provide. We're not limited in, we may, in the way that we may be in some more remote areas. Uh, we have access to a lot of different foods so we can accommodate quite a lot of dietary uh, needs and restrictions. That's not a worry as long as you let us know uh, and you have the option to do that but when you book as well as we confirm on our website just if there's any preferences that you may have. But really we are known for our culinary delights uh, in food as well as our wines as I mentioned. Um, people do just travel to Australia just for our foods. We have this cool modern take where we've taken a lot of traditional training that people have uh, gotten overseas and then come back and, and put that Australian spin on it. So yeah, I want the food there. <laughs> the food is delicious. <laughs> yeah. um, do you know much about the process used in dating the original or uh, Aboriginal handprints? Yeah, so there's a few different ways and it depends what you're dating um, because the evidence can come from various different things because it can come from the book part. Um, the rock art, a lot of the paints that are used are made from ochre, which is like a clay type uh, rock that is ground down and mixed with water uh, to create these beautiful bright colours. Uh, and so because it is rock, you can actually date it like rock, um, but you can also date the rock that it is on um, and see how that rock has um, aged over time because as rock gets exposed and weathered, we can date um, the exposed rock using the rock itself. We look at um, kind of like carbon dating, but we use potassium dating uh, in a way that the rock breaks down and that ages the rock. But we can use things that are on the surface that show us how long that rock has been exposed, uh, like the growth of lichen. And so we use lichenometry to get the dates there. So we can look at the rock paintings. We can also look at different rock structures. We have um, the foundations of buildings. We have um, certain ceremonial sites. Um, we also have middens. So middens are a collection of leftover food. So often on the coast, we see deposits of um, huge amounts of shells and we can date those shells as well. So there's a lot of different ways that we can date certain artifacts that give us the age of occupation in those areas. And it's really interesting stuff there. There's so much um, to talk about on that. If you wanna have a read, I'd recommend reading Dark Menu by Bruce Fosco. Uh, and it gives you a lot of details on this nation's occupancy in Australia. Very interesting. Um, how many guests per trip or per van? So the trip is 12, which is a really nice list. Um, so usually we do six and six and we mix it up every day. So you have opportunity to uh, listen to different ELs quite a lot, as well as getting to know all of your fellow travelers. Um, if that becomes, you know, seven and five or whatever, then no worries there. Um, but generally we're in two vehicles in every single location. Um, in the charter planes, we're all together. Um, but yeah, just the group size of 12, which is a really nice intimate group. And it means that we just get to experience so much so closely. Mm -hmm. Um, are you familiar with um, ways that guests could do a pre or post trip um, in New Zealand and connect it to this itinerary? Or is that something they should talk to their adventure specialists about? It's best to talk to your adventure specialist to get the details on what will work for you. Um, plus, they just know so much and they can help you with um, what dates might be preferable, uh, what time of year you want to go. But you can actually just look at the website um, on the itinerary and it will show you which dates line up with a New Zealand itinerary. Um, so if you have a look at the dates that are listed under the Australian South, they'll tell you whether they pair with a New Zealand itinerary. New Zealand trip is a beautiful trip in and of itself, um, but a lot of guests I know that have come through, I mean, you've come all this way, why not tag something else on? Um, so spending a few extra days in Australia before or after, as well as heading to uh, New Zealand is quite common. 
we do also see people exploring Sydney, Melbourne, um, staying in Hobart at the end in Tasmania for a little bit longer. There's just so much to see and do. So um, definitely have a look at the website for the dates. Um, but if you need more specific information, talk to your adventure specialist. Sounds good. Um, does the ultimate Australia trip that includes both North and South use the 2024 or 2025 itinerary? Does that make ultimate sense? Australia, yeah, the ultimate okay. Australia trip um, has its own itinerary. It incorporates the uh, Tasmanian and Kangaroo Island section of this itinerary, uh, but instead of going to uh, the Grampians or the Great Ocean Road, which would be the difference between the 24 and 25, uh, they head up to Ithera or Flinders Ranges, which is the central outback um, in the southern part of Australia. So you go to a whole other landscape, uh, but you start up in the north, you go to the Great Barrier Reef, Lady Elliot uh, Island, and up to the Daintree Rainforest, um, and from camp, then you head down to Tasmania. Uh, you then extend out to Mariah Island, which is a beautiful island off the coast of Tasmania. Um, and then you do the Tasmanian itinerary as I've described, but you do it in reverse order as you head north. And then up to Hikara, and then down to Kangaroo Island, and finish in Adelaide. So uh, a few differences in the centre there, um, but you're seeing so much more. It's so a 24 day itinerary, and you see as well as everything I've described, um, the Great Diary and the Tree Justice Spectrum. Excellent. Well, that is the last question we have for today. So I will hand it back to you for closing comments. Thanks, Sonny. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Um, I hope that filled some of your questions for the Australia South itinerary and what's coming up for 2025. If you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to send them through. Reach out to your adventure specialist or just email us at the email below, uh, info at nahab.com. It's a really amazing tour. And if you have ever thought of coming to Australia, it's just such an amazing, unique, but also efficient way to see so many unique ecosystems up close and personal. I really hope you have a look at it and come and investigate. Um, the beautiful nature of Australia. And if you have any more queries as well, I've done a few other webinars and there's a few more coming up in the next couple of weeks on some of the details of Australia if you're still on the fence. Thank you. Nikki, thanks again for sharing us, uh, sharing those details with us. It, it looks like a fabulous itinerary. I wanna thank everybody who tuned in. Please join us again tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com forward slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, we'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful day, everyone.